boys of Christ's College Cadet Corps are proud of their 25-pounder. They're doubling to it to get the weapon unlimbered. No other cadet corps has a gun like this, but this cadet unit has much modern equipment. Just now they're bringing up their mortars and machine guns. Such weapons are playing a big part on the Normandy front at this very moment. Here come the mortars. We hope the war will be over before these lads are of military age. These operations are just a regular part of the college training. Basic training and the use of the rifle is not forgotten. Modern weapons don't replace the steady hand and eye. Here's the signals unit. They train with portable radio telephone gear. The unit's military equipment looks a lot more modern than the college buildings, and it needs to. After all, it wouldn't be much use in these days learning how to fight the Wars of the Roses. Off they go, college boys who are keen members of a well-equipped cadet corps. Turn Servicemen's Re-Establishment League's new centre in Wellington aims at teaching disabled soldiers new occupations. Some pretty firm ideas on the subject are held by the director, Mr. Frank Loudon. It is absolutely no use just finding any old job for a disabled man. The first thing we have to do is to find where his inclinations lie and then train him in this work if at all possible. For instance, here is Jack Hanna who is learning to make artificial limbs. I was a journey machinist. Before that, I did a bit of mountain climbing down the Fox Glacier. Unfortunately, I didn't duck quick enough in Mersman too and lost a leg. They've given me a pretty good substitute and I'm getting around fairly well now. Trainees spend about three years here. They find that legs can be most interesting. Uh, that is, uh, artificial ones. They learn how to shape limbs from wood to do the metal and leather work. Amputees learn to use artificial legs and arms at work, and with the aid of mirrors, learn to walk again in this walking gallery, where they can watch and correct the behavior of their new legs. Of course, all trainees haven't lost a leg or an arm. Here's Bill Anderson. I was in the merchant service before the war, but when war broke out, I joined the Royal New Zealand Navy. But since then, my chest packed up a bit, so I decided to take on the manufacture of power shell. It took a bit of getting used to it first, but I'm getting all right at it now. But I think it's a lot better than splicing ropes or surgery and paint work. This is some of the work Bill Anderson is learning to do. It'll be sold through the league shops, where there are also the baskets made at the centre. The materials used were imported, but are now grown on a willow farm run by the league in the Hutt Valley. In the factory, the canes are made into postal containers, army signalers' baskets, bassinets, shopping baskets, and even strainers for fire hoses. One of the workers here is Joe Scholes, who was disabled in this war. I was in the engineers and uh, got tangled up with a mine just out of Chipley. And since I've only got a little sight left, the league is training me in uh, basket making for future occupation. Alongside Joe works Max Sheeran, who got his packet in the Somme in 1918. The League is always trying to find new jobs for disabled men. They do a good deal of leather work, making slippers, bags and purses. Boot repairing is a new venture, and one of the trainees who is ready to set up on his own is Wally Jones. I was a merchant seaman in this war. I was also in the Navy in the last war, and in between wars I also went to sea. Owing to an accident at sea, I, uh, to my legs, I found myself high and dry in the beach and uh, I had the chance of coming up here to learn the boot trade. In the cabinet making department is Joe Stapleton, who had an argument with a landmine at El Alamein. I was a timber worker before I went to the army, so I can't look my hands up higher than this now, so working on a bench suits me fine. These are some of the things Joe and his fellow workers are making. After a year's training, they get the chance of going to an outside job. 
for, as Joe says. I like it, and they treat us well here. Well, of course, we want to get into industry. Disabled men do not want charity. They want useful jobs. I feel sure there are many jobs in industry that could be done by disabled men. We are looking for those jobs. Perhaps you can help us. Let us have your suggestions. Arriving at an Italian aerodrome today is one of the latest York planes. This giant transport, twin brother to the Lancaster bomber, brings the Right Honourable Peter Fraser and party to Italy. To greet Mr Fraser is General Sir Bernard Freiburg. Mr Fraser has come to see for himself how the New Zealand division is faring after six months of hard and bitter campaigning in Italy. While he is here, he will also take the opportunity of telling the men what we in New Zealand are doing to back them up. Next morning the party sets off for the casino area. It is less than a week since casino fell, and along the roadside are many reminders that the fighting has only just moved on. These knocked out tanks have not yet been salvaged. These Polish dead are yet unburied. Leaving their jeeps, the party start climbing the monastery hill. It was over this ground that the most desperate battles of the whole Mediterranean campaign were fought. Here, for a long five months, the Germans managed to pin down the Allied advance. Up this steep slope, men had to fight, and General Freiburg shows Mr. Fraser and General Puttick how the German occupation of the monastery put them in command of the whole valley. The party clamoured over the monastery ruins. It was from this vantage point that the Germans directed their counter-attacks against the New Zealand division two months before. With such odds against them, Casino had been too tough for even the Kiwis to crack. But the way they fought brings pride to the New Zealanders looking down on all that is left of Casino Town. Arriving here today is the first party of 19 Anzac brides from Canada, girls whom New Zealand airmen met and married while training in Canada. This is no lease land. They've given up the maple leaf for the fern leaf, and they're here to live. We hope they'll stay as happy as they looked when they arrived. Their homes will be in towns and districts widely scattered throughout the Dominion. With some of them came their children, who look a credit to any country. The children wouldn't talk, but some of the wives obliged. They've asked me to say a few words on how your boys have been received in Canada. The boys are being well looked after, and they're well liked by one and all. Everyone speaks well of the New Zealand boys. In fact, I married one. And they have clubs, which if the boys go to, they can be taken to the homes of any of the people, no matter what class. And they can go any time after that to these homes, and they're made just one of us. I met my husband in Winnipeg, Canada. And we've been looking forward to coming to New Zealand for a long time, and I think we will like it very much. We've had a very wonderful trip, and it's been ex exceptionally more so for me, because when I embarked, I was on crutches, and uh, it's, I'm very, very glad to say now that I'm able to do without them, and more so because I was supposed to never walk again. <laughs> 